On the road, Paul encountered some disciples and asked, What baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told them to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. This week we're into the second part of the series, The Other Baptism. Uh, pretty much everybody's familiar with water baptism. Everybody familiar with water baptism? Wave at me, all right. And last week, or a couple weeks ago, we had a weekend with over 300 people that were water baptized. But you know, the Bible speaks of another baptism. And this one makes uh, Christians a little either uneasy or nervous sometimes for one of two reasons. One is either they're ignorant of the issue completely, they just don't understand it. Or they observe, observe some things that kind of wig you out. Anybody ever seen anybody do stuff that makes you, how, how do I say this? Anybody ever seen somebody just be weird? <laughs> well, you know, listen, like I said, we kind of have a little bit of fun with this, that everybody's got a little weird in their family. And if you said, well, there's none in mine, then you're the one. All right. So, but here's the deal. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Godhead. Nothing weird about him. And yet sometimes when people respond to him, they do so in ways that can, maybe people can lack a little understanding. That's what these three weeks are about. I want you to understand what this other baptism is. The Bible calls it the baptism with the Holy Spirit. In fact, in, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark, the, John said this. He said, he said, I indeed baptize you with water. But then he said, but Jesus coming after him would baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word baptized means to be immersed. Jesus, actually John the Baptist said that when Jesus comes and you receive him, he's going to bring you to an opportunity to be immersed in the person of God, the Holy Spirit. Next week, I'm going to give you more details about actually what the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit is designed to do in your everyday life. In fact, if, it, if, if, if what you believe about God or any Bible subject doesn't translate into your everyday life. It's basically a religion. It's just a, thing, a list of rules that you do or something that you observe in church. But I want you to have an understanding, not for a theological reason alone. I want you to have an understanding so you can experience the presence of God in your everyday life. We wrote a book on understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a little booklet for you. They're free and available to you right on your way out. Uh, there are a little desk there. You can just pick one up on your way if you'd like. But I want to talk to you today about an aspect of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, the, the part that really bothers people, the part that makes people a little kind of uneasy because it's, it, it, they've either heard nothing about it or what they have heard about it. It's kind of maybe concerned them. Let me read to you what happened when they were filled with the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Acts 2 verse 1 says this. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now listen, as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is not a learned language. This is not a linguistic expert. There are people, well, I'm, I have the gift of tongues. I'm good at languages. No, that just makes you good at languages. And by the way, there is nothing in the Bible called the gift of tongues. It doesn't exist. There is a gift of the Spirit called diverse kinds of tongues, but there is no gift of tongues. People say, I want to receive tongues. No, you don't receive tongues. You receive the Holy Spirit. Tongues come with the, the baptism. Right. It's kind of like buying a pair of shoes. The tongue comes with the shoes. But people get worried. They get nervous about this tongues thing. What's that about? Because it, it, it is a language unknown to the speaker. It is a language unknown to you. It's, it's not unknown to God. In fact, the Bible says you could be speaking in a, 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 the tongue of men or a tongue of angels. But what's the deal? Why do that? God, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, what's this tongues thing for? What I'm going to show you today in the scripture is the issue of being able to worship God and speak with other tongues has nothing to do with you putting on a show for people. In fact, 
the whole book of 1 Corinthians, much three chapters of it anyway, was dealing with the abuse of this issue in the Corinthian church. When you speak in tongues in a church, Paul said, you only do that if somebody is, is, is literally endowed or graced by God to interpret what's being said. Otherwise, don't do that. And here's what he said. People will think you're crazy. And isn't it interesting, when it comes to this subject, people still think people are crazy because of the misuse. But like your outer, how many of you realize you have an outer man and an inward man? Your outer man is your body. In fact, how many of you realize this? This outer man, your body, doesn't get to live forever. How many of you know this thing's declining to its end? The older it gets, you can lose some shingles, all kind of stuff can happen. You can build your foundation a little bit. Yeah. But you do have an inward man. As your outer man has a voice and a language, so does your inward man. I'm going to show you in the scripture the voice of your inward man, where it can come out of your physical mouth, is connected to praying or worshiping in other tongues. Again, when you take outside of the usage within the context of that to be t a, a tongue to be spoken and interpreted in the local church, aside from that, it primarily is a devotional aspect or devotional usage. In fact, the Bible says that when you worship in other tongues, you worship well. How many of you think it's a good thing to worship God? How, and you know the Bible talks about praying in other tongues. How many of you think prayer is a good thing? But let me give you an example of an instance where somebody prayed in the spirit, the Bible uses this term synonymously, praying in the spirit, praying with other tongues means the same thing. There was a lady in my home church. She was a lady that was given to prayer more than most. And uh, she got a hold of my mom and said, uh, a while, this is when Michelle and I were living in Africa uh, many years ago. She got a hold of my mom and said, such and such a day and, and, and time, I was so burdened in my heart to pray for John and Michelle. And I just spent some time, I, because I didn't know what to pray for. Do you know Romans says it this way, that the Spirit himself helps our weakness in prayer, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought to pray. The Spirit himself will make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be put into articulate speech. You see, if you live any length of time, you're going to come to places in your life where you don't know what to do. Anybody ever have I don't know what to do moments in your life? And if you haven't, you're probably inside somebody's womb right now and haven't been born yet. Everybody has that. And certainly when it comes to the future, none of us know what the future holds. But do you know when you don't know what to pray for as you ought to, do you know that you can pray things in the spirit out into the future? God can use you to pray a supply. As the scripture says, prayer brings a supply of the Holy Spirit to the circumstance of your life. Well, she called my mom, got a hold of her at church and said, well, can you find out if something was going on because I was so burdened to pray for them. But I didn't know what to pray for. I don't, this was back before cell phones and, and email and text messages. There was no way to get a hold of people, particularly where we were in Zambia. And, and we were driving through Zambia. Here's, here's the exact time frame she was praying. We found out later. She wrote us a letter. See, Zambia uh, used to be northern Rhodesia. When it, was, when it became independent from, from Rhodesia, it, became, it was ruled by a man named Kenneth Koenda. And Koenda uh, was one of the rebel leaders and, and revered in the country, but it, be, it became a communist nation. And, and they basically took... 20 years and all of the infrastructure began to be deteriorated. The roads were basically gone that connected the towns. And we would drive on these roads and we had a land cruiser, which is designed for this type of terrain. But it was so bad to drive on, it shook loose our headlights and they went out. Now, I don't know if you've ever lost your headlights, but if you've ever lost your headlights in the middle of Africa in the nighttime, that is not a good thing. But what we did have in the car was one of the spots, like you would use to spot deer with. So I'm driving with my right arm out because you drive on the opposite side of the, opposite side of the road in Zambia. And, uh, and, so, and I'm using this spotlight as our headlight because we've got to get to where we're going. And so I'm driving along. We come around a bend. 
And if you've ever lived in a third world country, this won't surprise you. S someone had been driving their 18-wheeler, had a problem, and they left the trailer right in the middle of the road. No flashers, nothing. And it's pitch dark. We come around the bend, and in America, 18-wheelers have a little bar that comes down so that if you hit it, 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 in theory, is to slow your vehicle down so you don't get decapitated. These don't exist there. So we came around the bend, and the minute we came around the bend, here it was sitting right, right in front of us. It, it literally, where I had no reaction time. To make matters worse, coming on the road was another vehicle where I couldn't go to the right, or in that case, the left, because things are backwards there for us. For them, it's right side up. And the other side would have took, taken me and we would have rolled the vehicle. I, I literally was frozen. We all, all, here's what we all did in unison. We kind of went, ah! And the next thing that we knew, with my hand still holding this out the window, we were on the other side of it driving. And I have no idea how we got on the other side of it. None. I didn't drive around it. Everybody there knows I didn't drive around it. I said, well, how'd you get over there? I don't know. You say, well, you know, that, 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 that just seems far-fetched to me. I'm glad you weren't praying for me. <laughs> I'm really glad you weren't the one praying for me. See, I'm talking to you about a living God, not religious games. I'm talking about God showing up in human beings' lives in everyday life. And because somebody was, that was, was sensitive to God enough to be able to pray, and because she didn't know what to pray for, she ought to. She spent probably 45 minutes to an hour praying in the spirit over us. Now, I don't know. I want to see the video when I get to heaven. I don't know what happened. I don't know how we got on the other side of that vehicle. But I can tell you this. It is more than likely. Maybe the, the people in the back seat could have survived it. But the people in the front seat, we would have been cut in half. Now, here's my question to you. Is that a value to you to have in your life? It is to me. But you need to understand that there is a difference, a distinct difference as a believer in being born of the Spirit or born again or making Jesus your Savior and being filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. They're two separate experiences. But let me make this clear. If you've invited Jesus into your heart, how many of you have invited Christ into your heart? If you've done that, now listen, this is very important, then you already have the Holy Spirit in you. You are born of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Bible says it this way. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you are not your own. Your body, he said, belongs to God, and you are the very temple of the Holy Spirit. So he's in you if you're a, a Christian. But that's being born of the Holy Spirit. In, and yet there is a separate and subsequent experience of that called being filled with the Holy Spirit or being baptized or immersed with the Holy Spirit. And throughout Scripture, you find it in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, 9, 10, Acts chapter 19, people being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues. But if you understand the purpose of it, then it takes the weirdness away from it. In fact, when we get to these Scriptures, I think it's going to give you so much desire to want to have this aspect in your everyday life. But I want to take you to a scripture that shows you the difference between receiving Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me read it to you in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 5 says this. Then Philip, who was known as the evangelist in the scripture, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing, seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many that were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Verse 12 says, and when they believed Philip, everyone say they believed. When they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were, they, both men and women were baptized. So they believed and were baptized. What did Jesus say? If you believe and are baptized, you are saved. Are these people now Christians? Of course they are. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria, past tense, had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them. 
that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now listen, for as yet he, not it, he had fallen upon none of them. They, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then he laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now you, you either have to be dishonest or religiously brainwashed not to look at those verses and realize there's a distinction. There's a separation of days between the two events. In fact, the first question Paul asked that was on the sermon bumper when we came into this message, when he showed up in Ephesus, when he thought he was meeting with these 12 men that he met, he thought they were Christians, and he said, the first question, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And he came to find out they weren't even Christians. They had been baptized in John's baptism. He led them to Christ. They were water baptized, and he laid his hands on them. They were filled with the Spirit and spoke with other tongues. Paul asked a question that I'll ask you today. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? If you haven't, that's what this morning is about. To give you the opportunity to actually experience that wonderful gift of, of being baptized with the Spirit that's available to every Christian. And I found there are two basic reasons why people fail to receive. One is they're just simply ignorant. They don't even know about this. And that's only solved through teaching. And the other one is that people feel like I'm not good enough for this. I have no way am I ready for God to touch me like this. I, you don't know the week I had. You don't know the stuff I say. I, I, I might not do the tongues thing, but you ought to hear some words I speak. <laughs> Can I tell you this? The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, wants to, and literally in the Greek, fall into the ditch of life with you. That's what it means for him to come alongside and help you. Actually, he wants to come at the lowest moment of your life. He, never, he won't turn you away. Now, let me take just a, a little bit of time and let's answer this tongues thing. Why the tongues? Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. For if anyone speaks in a tongue, now listen now, he does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. He's saying this, when someone is speaking or praying in another tongue, he's not speaking to men. I've had people come to me and say, well, I've never heard you do that because it's not for you. I pray in the spirit every day of my life because I don't know what to pray for as I ought to pray. And I'll show you in a moment that you're commanded to do both in the Bible. Pray with your understanding and in other tongues. But I want you to get this. He said, when you pray in the spirit or speak in other tongues, you are speaking directly to God. Now listen to how you do it. He said that no one understands you because you are uttering divine secrets or mysteries, listen now, with your spirit. Your inward man is uttering a language that bypasses your own understanding and you are praying out divine secrets over your life. You're praying out divine secrets over your family. Since our children were born, Michelle and I have prayed in the spirit over their future spouses because I don't know what to pray for. I don't know what to pray for the, those, those people or their families, but we've prayed over them in the spirit because I don't know what to pray for as I ought to. And by the way, we prayed for our children that way too because how many of you know everybody has flaws? And I'm saying, God, we just pray over our kids. It is such an amazing thing to be able to pray out of your own spirit and not just out of your head. He goes on to say in verse four of this chapter that when you speak in an unknown tongue, you edify yourself. The word edify is the same word we would use like to charge a battery. Praying in the spirit or speaking in, in the spirit to God or in other tongues is like taking a jumper cable from the, the very heart of God into your life. Anybody would like, anybody like to be charged up by the power of God, that's how you do it. Very often, people don't understand these spiritual dynamics. All they do is they hear something and they see something maybe done oddly and they push away from the real or the genuine. There are, there are either people that misuse these things and push people away or kind of wig people out. How many of you, I'm, let's just be honest, how many of you, when you hear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues, maybe some of the things you've heard or seen, you get a little bit like, mm -hmm. look, I've seen some stuff. I'm I'll raise my hand. 
I've been in places where I was like, you people scare me. And I'm the guy speaking. I'm not exaggerating. But for the most part, people push away because they're ignorant or they've seen something, but they miss out on the ability, listen to me, to utter secrets about your future, to pray over the people you love, even to be prompted by God like that precious woman was to pray over Michelle and I. Look what the, in the 14th chapter, verse 14 and 15. And we're winding this down because, and remember this, from now on when you come to church, remember, when I finish speaking, the service isn't over. We're just getting warmed up. I'm cutting back the amount of time I speak. And we're going to have about 15 minutes at the end of every service, same time frame. We're going to get into the presence of God and expect the power of God, the move of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit to flow in this room. Now, now listen, not in a way to weird you out. I'm, this, we're not going to have people, you know, running up and down, coming behind you and grabbing you going, ah, we're, that ain't going to happen. That's just, that, that's human beings who love Jesus just kind of ain't happening. Because the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit moves, it should profit everybody. So we're not talking about something weird happened. We're talking about God Amen. moving in your life. Don't be a cafeteria Christian. Oh God, I'll take this part of you, but mm, no, I'll have that. He's God. Amen. And Jesus said, I want you to be immersed in the person of the Holy Spirit. Look at, look at chapter 14, verse 14. Paul, Paul wrote and he said, for if I pray... In a tongue, my spirit prays. One translation says it this way, my spirit prays by the Holy Spirit in me, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit or in other tongues, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit or in other tongues, and I'll also sing with my mind. Most Christians have no problem with prayer in your own language, but there is a type of prayer the Bible said that you can pray out of your spirit, out of your inward man, literally in, enabled by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit to pray out a supply into your life and into your future. And at times even to save somebody's life. I shared this last night and I don't know why I thought this happened three or four years ago, but, uh, when I mentioned it, Pastor, it happened with John and Kathy Spencer, Pastor John. He said, no, this was 2006. So this was like 11 years ago. How many of you know time can just move on you? I just can't believe that I have friends as old as Steve Moore. It's unbelievable. <laughs> well, about three o'clock in the morning, Michelle's, I hear her. It sounds like she's sick. I, it sounds like somebody's kind of groaning or, and I, I can't quite make it out. And it wakes me up. We have a king size bed and Michelle's five foot nothing. So I'm reaching over and I can't find her. I thought, Jesus, did you return and leave her and leave me? Take her. I mean, where'd she go? And I, and I can faintly hear her and I think, oh my, she's not. And I said, Michelle, are you okay? I thought maybe she was sick. And all she said was, honey, I I have a burden to pray. And she said this, she said, help me pray. And then she went right back to prayer. And she's not praying in English. She's praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues because she's praying what she doesn't know what she's praying for. And, and, and I, I went back to sleep. <laughs> I, I, I prayed a moment, I really did. And then the spirit of slumber fell on me and hallelujah, I went to sleep. <laughs> And uh, about 45 minutes later, she gets into bed and she wakes me up. It's about five in the morning. She said, honey, go, go take a shower and get ready. The phone's going to ring. Some, uh, this something has just happened and, and you're going to need to go to the hospital. Go get ready now. I said, well, okay. And, and I kept sleeping. And, uh, <laughs> and, but here's what she said to me. She said, but when it happens, listen. I don't care what the report is. I don't care what, any, what happened to who and whoever said what. I'm telling you, sweetheart, when I prayed, I know that I prayed that to the other side. And I know they're going to be okay. So when you get the call, you tell them they're going to be fine. No matter what you hear. And I said, oh, okay, honey. 
And, and sure enough, about 5.30, my phone rings. I pick it up, and it's Kathy Spencer. And they're in the hospital. They'd gotten there very early for John to get some kind of test. And while he's there, he throws several, I think, I think eight, seven or eight blood clots through, into his lungs. And pulmonary, pulmonary embolisms are not good things. They, they can end up, you know, choking stuff. I mean, it's bad. And it was extremely serious. And she said, can you come? And, and she said, I, I, so I, I didn't want to tell her I should have been ready. But here's what I knew. I, I said, um, I, 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 they didn't get the, I didn't, I wasn't showered. I kind of just threw stuff on and went, right? So, but here's the, re, here's the reality. I knew when I went there, it had already been done. So when I got there and I finally got in with John and they were being told some very, very serious things. I said, John, listen, and I explained what happened. I said, about three o'clock in the morning, Michelle prayed this answer out for you. I said, I don't know your way forward. I don't know what you're going to walk through, but I can guarantee you one thing. You are not dying today and you're going to be fine and you're going to fully recover. I said, I don't even have to pray for you. It's already been done. Now, at that time, John was working as an executive in PPG with a call on his life. He's now a pastor in this church, and he and Kathy have been such a blessing to this church for so many years. And yet he could have been, we could have lost him. Such, a, such incredible people. Now, here's what I want you to understand about the things of God. Is there anything that you think in your life is more valuable than having that kind of access to God? You see, I want you to have a kind of intimacy. Well, God talked to Michelle that way because she's a pastor's wife. There's nowhere in the Bible where pastors and their wives or preachers or anybody gets a special line to God. They don't exist. We are all his kids and ain't no special ones. We're all loved by God. And anything accessible to me is accessible to you. And her intimacy with God was such that she not only knew to pray in her heart, she knew when she was done and she knew that it was, often you pray and you don't ever know what had happened. But she said, baby, that phone's about to ring. Go get ready. Now that, I've never met anybody in my life who doesn't want that in their life. That's what I mean by the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And there's so much more. Next week, I'm going to give you even a broader picture of what the work of the Holy Spirit in your life can do. And by being filled with the Spirit, how it gives you access to this greater capacity and greater dimension of God. And so today, my hope is simply this. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, that you get to be today. Now, see, every, here's where people usually struggle with God. It's in the right now. Religion never struggles with God in the past. Oh, God's good. He's great. Look what he did in the book of Exodus. But he's not the God of the I was. How many of you know God's not the great has been? And what he's going to do in the future. How many of you know he's not the God of the could be's and will be's only? How many of you know God's not the God of just potential? Someday he's going he's to get out there and do something great. When God said his name in the Bible, he called himself I am. Amen. The God of the present. And I want to encourage you today to receive the power and person and work of the Holy Spirit in your life. In fact, in a moment, let me, let me just be really plain. What I want to be able to do for you is to help you understand what I'm about to do. I don't like surprising people in church. I don't like telling people, raise your hand and then surprise, hey, here's your next step. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you just in a moment if you want to receive the Holy Spirit in your life today. And as I do this, worship team, come on back out. And then I'm going to ask you to simply get up as we stand in a few moments to worship and go to these two center uh, tunnels, tunnels two and three. And there'll be people there to meet you and they'll walk you right back to the, where our bookstore used to be. Now we call it the Our Church Room. You can head right back there and people will talk to you and pray with you. And you can leave today filled with the Holy Spirit. And see, again, I'm not trying to you say, well, why, why don't you hype this up? God doesn't, he's God. He doesn't need hype. See, so often people think for God to do something great, we have to, people have to get into some fever pitch. You don't. All you have to do is to hunger for him, is to ask him. In fact, Jesus said it this way. 
Anyone that asks will receive the person of the Holy Spirit. He turns no one away. And so today, if you desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to leave here with this wonderful Bible experience. And you could take it in your everyday life and help you to grow in areas that you've never imagined possible in your life. I long for you to live this life. Not some weird, Christianese kind of spooky thing. I'm talking about you living in the power of God in everyday life when life can get really bad and ugly. Would you bow your heads with me quickly? If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I've never been filled with the Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit as you've shared today. I'm a Christian, but I've never really received that Bible experience, and I want that. And I want, I want to be prayed for today, and I want to be filled with the Spirit, and I want to leave here having that capacity to speak out of my own spirit before God, divine secrets. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is not when, well, God, what do I do? Yield to him. This isn't up to God at this point. What God is wanting to do stops in your decision is where it's picked up right now. What you do determines what happens next, not God. Because you have to willfully invite him in. He's a gentleman. He goes nowhere except by invitation. So if you're here today and say, Pastor, that's me. I'd like to be prayed for in that private place. I want, to, I want to leave here knowing I've been filled with the Spirit. Every head bowed, every eye closed, right where you're seated, up in the risers everywhere. Just simply wave at me. Raise your hand at me right now if you want to be filled with the Spirit. Sure, there are hands everywhere. God bless you. Put your hands back down. In a moment, I'm going to ask us to stand together. And we're going to go into the presence of God. Now listen, the service isn't over. And we're going to wait on God. We're going to worship him with all of our hearts. And we're going to trust that God, the Holy Spirit, moves in this room and does things that only he can do. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe when you come to church, you can get your life changed. I believe the same Jesus that healed the sick then is ever alive today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I'm trusting that today, that he moves by the power of his spirit to break chains in your life, to bring healing to your life, to break bonds of oppression, whatever your needs may be. I want you to learn in church in these last moments that we share now weekly how to yield to the presence of God. Don't get in a hurry. In fact, we're staying in the same time frame. And be able to wait on God and respond when the Holy Spirit begins to move in the room and let God do great things in your life because that's exactly what he wants to do to you and for you today. Let's stand together. And if you raised your hand to desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we have folks waiting for you right now in the tunnels. Would you give those folks a great big hand and celebrate with them? Come on, as they make their way. Go ahead out of your seats. Make your way back over there right now. Come on, man, celebrate with these folks. Best decision of your life to follow God. The worship team's about to bring us back into the presence of God. Can I ask you today, take these final 10 minutes or so, and why don't you let God do something great in your soul? Why don't we pour our hearts out to him in worship? Let me pray over you as we create a hunger and expectation for what God wants to do in these moments, and let's worship him with all of our hearts together. Father, we come today to be grateful for a Savior. And Father, I thank you for the power and the person and the work of the Holy Spirit to sweep this room. I thank you that as you manifest your presence, as you give direction, that we'll yield to you and that people's lives will be changed forever because it is impossible to be in your presence and not be changed. If you're here in this place and you've never given your life to Jesus or you're far from God, I want to pray for you right where you're seated. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you, never forsake you. Your life will never be the same again. In this presence, give your life to him. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you don't know Jesus or you're far from God, say, Pastor, please pray for me. Right where you're standing, would you just simply raise your hand and I'll pray for you. Do it right now. Why don't you get everything God has for you today? Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. Listen, if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud. We'll pray it together with you. We're going to go right back into the presence of God worshiping. And if you prayed with me for these, either one of these two prayers, come up and tell a prayer partner. Come up and let them know so they can pray for you. If you need a Bible, we have one for you. We want to help you take your next steps in God. It's so important. But let's pray it out loud together with them. Say it where you hear it with them. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Jesus, thank you for coming into my life. I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. 
Thank you for coming. My sin is washed away. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand. Would you best decision of your life?